Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to lecture five of the Reliable and Interpretable Artificial Intelligence course taught at uh, ETH Zurich. Uh, my name is Martin Vechev, and I'm a professor at ETH. And uh, today's lecture five uh, is going to be about uh, mathematical certification of uh, neural networks. So we are going to be moving on from uh, adversarial attacks adversarial examples and uh, adversarial defenses into now um, providing uh, guarantees over, uh, over the reasoning that we're doing over the neural network. Okay, so, so right, so, so far we looked at uh, adversarial examples in different application domains. Um, is both attacks and defenses, FGSM method, PGD, Kalini and Wagner, and PGD defense. Um, and a lot of these methods uh, tend to work well in practice experimentally, right? So there's tons of works that are trying to find different kinds of adversarial examples based on the principles that we outline. And there are many variants of the PGD defense, um, which uh, try to experimentally defend uh, the neural network to build network which are networks which are less susceptible to adversarial examples right um, however there is a you know a fundamental problem here and this is that uh, many of these methods essentially amount to uh, testing and uh, best case effort on uh, defending against these uh, attacks and so they can be likened uh, in the classic uh, program reasoning literature to uh, program testing. So as I mentioned, these attacks and defenses are very similar to testing. In fact, they are testing. And they tend to work in, when we practice sometimes, but really provide, there are no formal guarantees that, that come with, with their use. Uh, no provable, formal, certifiable guarantees, right? And as we know from Dijkstra, um, you know, um, Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So if we, that's a quote by Edsger Dijkstra, and if we tie this down to our setting of uh, finding adversarial examples, in other words, finding counter examples to the property of robustness, right? So finding input that make the network behave in a non-robust manner, then really all of these algorithms and methods uh, do not guarantee that if a uh, adversarial example exists, uh, they will uh, for sure uh, find it in practice, right? Um, and so this motivates the study that we're starting now when we're going to be spending a number of lectures on this problem, um, looking into methods and studying methods where you can obtain um, full certification mathematical guarantees, right? So uh, gradually uh, the material gets uh, a bit more technical, more technical, starting to look at symbolic methods, and then later how to combine this uh, gradient-based uh, optimization with uh, these uh, symbolic methods, right? So let's see, what problem are we going to want to solve and how are we going to go about solving this problem, right? So, so the problem we want to address here is the following. We want to, you know, develop at a very high level an automated verifier, a certifier, a mathematical verifier uh, that works automatically and that can prove properties, whatever properties we care about. For instance, robustness is one of them. There could be other properties uh, of uh, realistically sized uh, deep neural networks, right? So we want to be given a neural network and we want to be able to prove something about it, right? something about its behavior. Right, uh, with a hundred percent certainty. Okay, so if we're able to do this, there are many different use cases. So, for instance, in the certification of uh, cyber physical systems, right, that inter interact with the environment, where neural networks are perhaps, perhaps uh, decision making components, um, proving robustness, of course, that is something that we've looked at. Uh, this problem of robustness is something we've looked at so far learning interpretable specifications, comparing neural networks, but generally when we're interested in providing guarantees. So in the case of robustness, we want to be able to prove that no matter how we perturb a given point within some range, we can actually prove that uh, uh, all of the perturbations are guaranteed to not be adversarial examples, for example, right? Um, 
And in practice, there could be an infinite number of certain perturbations or very large uh, or unbounded number. And hence, or very large or unbounded, but you know, so large that you wouldn't even be able to enumerate if you just try to enumerate the point. So you need something else here. And we're going to start looking at these techniques. So let's look at the, this uh, certification problem statement, right? How would we phrase the problem more generally? And then get an intuition by uh, looking at uh, ro the robustness uh, property specifically, right? Um, okay, so here we're given a, in this problem statement, we're given a neural network N, right? And we're given some property over its inputs, phi. So that uh, property over, over, it, over its inputs, phi, will be called the precondition. So phi is the precondition. It uh, captures some restriction on the inputs. Um, we'll see in a second some examples of this phi. And we also have a property over its outputs, psi. So this psi is called the post condition, right, of, the, of our specification. Okay, so the combination of phi and psi, phi psi gives you the specification of the neural network N that you would like to prove. All right. And so the problem statement then becomes as follows. So let's. Uh, Try to explain this to those who haven't seen this notation. Okay, it's actually pretty simple, but just to make sure we're on the same page because we're using this notation all over the place. So what it says is, this is the for all quantifier, right? So what it says is that for all the inputs, right? I is, this big I is um, some domain, perhaps the domain of images, right? Um, so it says for any image here, you can read it this way, okay? Uh, if the point here, if the image or whatever it is, the 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 point is, um, let's say it's an image, I is an image, and so if the the point satisfies this precondition phi, um, then we want to be able to prove that the when we run the neural network uh, on this point, then whatever results we get, this n of i, whatever results we get from running the image for the network, right? Uh, this result satisfies okay and this is the this is the symbol for satisfaction satisfies um the post condition psi okay so that's what we want to be able to prove so this notation here is this is implication okay this is satisfaction this is the universal quantifier here right um and whether we're going to be able to prove that or if the property does not hold so for instance if n of i does not satisfy C, so if it does not satisfy it, it doesn't satisfy it, they want to be able to return the violation. And the violation would be I. This is the image, the input, the point which doesn't satisfy this property. So this is the, uh, the certification problem statement uh, of neural networks. That is the general problem statement, uh, safety verification, verification of safety properties of neural networks, which is pretty much all. Uh, 99% of properties in practice, uh, like robustness, for instance, right? Okay, um, so this is the problem statement, so let's uh, move on, um, okay? So let's see how this problem statement looks like um, in our case of robustness, so our property is gonna be robustness, and we're going to look at the character classification, this MNIST data set, where you have 10 labels, zero to nine, you're trying to take an image and find the character that this image uh, illustrates, right? So how would it look like? Um, let's see the process of framing the certification problem, right? Um, so as a step one, we're going to define the precondition formally. So the precondition phi, we're going to define it formally, whatever it is for our application domain. And so for the property of robustness that we care about, you know, we have the different norms, for instance, right? It could be some other region, but here we're looking at the, for instance, the norm, the L-infinity norm, and that's something we've already looked at. So we want to consider all the images within some distance of the, all the images X prime that are within some distance of the given uh, image X. So here I've just shown an example of if the image is eight, there is some uh, hypercube here that captures all of the images within this distance of uh, epsilon from, uh, from eight. So you normally have to define this precondition. In other words, the first part of the specification. And 
robustness essentially captures the second part of the specification. So let's see here what we have. Um, a little bit more formally. Uh, so let me just use this uh, notation here. All right. And so what we have here, we have the precondition phi, the region phi. Um, and then uh, let me change the color. Uh, maybe maybe uh, orange is good. We have this precondition phi over here. All right. And then for every pixel that we have here, we have 700, uh, uh, 785 pixels. Um, then what happens is that, well, in this example here, some of the pixels are kept concrete, right? They have concrete values. So we are not quite looking at the L-infinity norm. We are looking at uh, something a little bit easier, like in this example, uh, where you can essentially correspond, corresponds to a brightening attack. In other words, we are looking at the range only for specific pixels. Now you don't have to worry about what these things are here, this, uh, epsilon 1, epsilon 784, and so on and so forth. Oh, look at those later. They're just some symbolic values that range between 0 and 1. Okay, don't have to worry about this. Uh, but ultimately, this will dis define some symbolic shape. This phi here will define some symbolic shape where you know some of the in some of the inputs are going to be kept as is, like in the origin original image, and others are going to be described by some symbolic values. Um, this is actually an example of the zone of domain application, zone of relaxation that we're going to be looking at later. We don't have to worry about this now. Um, okay, so important part, define the precondition, the region which you care to certify as robust, right? And then, um, let's clear this. Um, then what we have is, um, you know, this is the robustness certification problem. Then what we want to do is we want to uh, prove that um, you know, these images in the region all classified to the same thing. So this was our generic uh, statement right here. So we need to see how to instantiate it. So in this, the generic one that's in orange now, right, this phi, where this saw some definition of phi, maybe it's the L infinity, maybe it's something simpler than the L infinity, but it captures this symbolic region here on the, on the left, bottom left, right? And now what remains to do is to define the psi, which is the post condition, like the property that we want to hold when the network processes the given input for this output, right, n of i. And so let's pick a property here because we care about robustness. Uh, so the property psi could be that, for instance, every point classifies to free, okay? because the original image X classifies to three. So we wanna prove that everything in the region phi, in the, in the input region phi classifies to three, okay? So this property would be expressed like this, right? So it says that C can be defined, can be defined, is defined as follows. It just says that what you would expect, it says that for all uh, J between zero and nine, for all the digits between zero and nine, the output of the network here, uh, you don't have to worry about this. This is really just the um, vector that you get before the softmax, before the last softmax there where you get the distribution. So these are unnormalized distributions here. And so what it says is that um, the value that you have at that entry of three, which is the um, probability that, the normalized probability that you classify the input as, uh, as digit three is greater or equal to any other any other, uh, any other probability, a normalized probability here. So you can express like this, the robustness post condition, right? And then you can try to prove this property, right? Um, so everything is formally stated. We have the region, we have the, the, the precondition, we have the post condition psi, all right? And we have the, um, the generic statement here that we want to want to prove. Now, of course, notice here because this is a called a bounded quantifier. This for OJ because it ranges over um, a bounded number of values between uh, zero and nine. So we have ten values. So really, you can unfold this. Um, you can simplify that formula not to have the quantifier, but just to have a bunch of conjunctions. So it would have something like O um, three is greater than or equal to O zero and O3 is greater than or equal to O1, O3 is greater than or equal to O2, O3 is greater than or equal to then O3, and so on and so forth. 10 conjunctions like this, and then you'll be able to get rid of the 
the quantifier. And that's 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 something that normally happens when you do robustness certification, right? Okay, so I hope that is clear. So it's clear that the main challenge here is actually how would you go about proving this robustness uh, certification, right? How would you how would you prove this property that you care about? Let's see. Um, now what we have here, right? So the key challenge is going to be how are we actually going to be proving this property here, um, right? So the problem is, the difficult part here is that this phi, this precondition here, as I mentioned several times already, can capture um, unbounded number of inputs, unbounded number of points, or potentially an infinite number of points, but also a very large unbounded number of points or large but uh, extremely bounded but extremely high number of points. So typically you cannot just enumerate these points here, all of the points, right? Imagine that you have, uh, 785 pixels, and then you are changing, uh, every pixel has two values, right? You'd get two to the 780, 85 uh, combinations. Right? That's completely feasible to enumerate here. So this is a big challenge, and uh, we need to see how to um, solve this problem without actually enumerating points in the that belong to the uh, precondition phi. Um, so let's, uh, let's do this. Uh, let's, uh, Let's move on and see. Now, before I tell you how to how to do this, before we start studying methods on how to actually do this, right? Um, I wanted to provide you a little bit of a classification of the different certification methods so that you have an idea where each method fits in, right? And what the upsides and downsides are of each of these uh, each of these methods, right? So a bit of a taxonomy here before we actually look at how would you actually solve this certification problem. Um, and so there are several uh, classification of, of certification methods. Um, probably the most important one is whether the, well, the method is sound or unsound, right? And so a, a reasoning method, right, that reasons about computation programs, whether programs are just standard programs, like a device driver or something, or an image parser or a neural network, it doesn't matter. We say that the reasoning method um, is sound. In the case when, if the program actually violates the property, right, the program, the neural network, let's say, does not satisfy the property of robustness, right, the, the specification does not hold, when the method terminates, when the verification finishes, then the verifier will state that the property is violated. So if it does not hold, it will for sure detect that the, um, that the property is violated, right? Um, and so this is really what is meant by certification. So really uh, saying certification can be sound or unsound is a little bit of a um, kind of, uh, perhaps not the right, um, the right uh, term because certification methods are typically uh, meant to be sound. Um, of course, there's probabilistic certification where you can certify some property with certain probabilities. Uh, so where you may not be 100% sound, you're sound with certain probabilities. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at here for now is um, sound certification methods, right? Uh, so certification, typically when somebody says I have certifier, um, typically it means um, that uh, it is sound, okay? Uh, later, in the later in the course, we are going to start looking a little bit at uh, probabilistic certification methods as well. So sound is a very important property. To summarize, if a property is violated, if the program does not satisfy the property, like if the network really, truly, there is a point around our input X, which makes the network not robust, then the verifier will say that if it is sound, it will say that the network is not uh, not robust, right? Uh, okay, now it is unsound, the method is instance is unsound. If, again, if the neural network, let's say the program violates a property, this violates the specification, the method could actually potentially terminate and it can state that the property is satisfied, All right? So even though it, it, is, it doesn't hold, even though there is an input which is not robust, um, right, gets a different label, let's say, than the original image, um, the verifier or the reasoning engine may say, or whatever, whatever um, 
automated reasoning that you're using may say that actually it holds. Um, so adversarial attack methods in some sense you know, are basically like test case generation. They're generating counterexamples for robustness. Um, they are typically unsound. Um, they may miss violations, right? Even if it doesn't hold, they, you know, if, if, if after certain iterations, it does not find the violation, um, it can just say, well, I couldn't find it. And so even though it exists, it couldn't find it. So there is this differentiation between sound and unsound. When we talk about mathematical simplification, we really are talking about sound, sound, sound reasoning. And unless it's explicitly said that it is unsound, we're going to assume that things are sound, right? Okay, another classification that is uh, important is this completeness versus incompleteness business, right? So let's say I even have a, a certification method here in my hands. Um, so we say that this method is complete, right? If it can prove the property, if the property holds, it can prove so. So if your neural network is robust, all right, then it's actually robust for the given, given region phi and, and psi for our specification, then the method can prove it that it's robust, right? Um, Okay, so if it holds, it can prove it. You know, so this is different than soundness. Now, we say the method is incomplete if you cannot guarantee um, that it can prove the property when it actually holds. And so the property holds, the property is satisfied, but the network, the verifier cannot actually um, prove it. So the network is robust for our specification, but it actually says that it is not. It may say that it is not, right? is an incomplete method. Okay, so I made a little bit of a table here uh, of um, soundness and com soundness versus completeness versus automation uh, for this um, automated verification in general and specifically for our setting of neural networks. Um, but here generally this, this slide is really for any, any kind of computation that we want to reason about, not just neural networks, right? So let's populate a little bit because it will allow us to very easily classify the um, certifiers later that we're going to be looking at. So we have the column sound, whether it's sound, whether it's complete, and, where, and what the corresponding automated algorithm, how does the certifier actually work? So we definitely want automation. We want to be able to certify the neural network automatically. And now let's examine the different guarantees. So in the first row, when the, uh, the certifier, the verifier is sound and it is complete, which is pretty much the ideal case, Right, this is what you want. And that's something that we'll discuss in the next slides, how would you actually build such a verifier? Right, that, that's, that's uh, the ideal case here. We'll see why we actually need to consider the other cases. Now, you on the second row, we can have the situation where the verifier is sound. Okay, so if, the, if there is a violation, it will definitely detect it but is incomplete. So it sacrifices incompleteness. So why would you want to go from complete to incomplete? Like what's the motivation given that being complete is good, right? Uh, now one trivial algorithm here is, which I've put here, right? It's a trivial algorithm. I can just say, um, you know, the property does not hold, okay? The I always say whenever, whatever computation you give me neural network, I immediately return, that's my verifier. It just says, no, the property does not hold, okay? And so this is a sound and uh, incomplete verifier, right? Um, of course, this is not a very useful verifier. And so what, what do we actually want for certification? What kind of verifier do we actually want? Well, ideally we want the first row, sound and complete, but generally this is hard as we'll see in a second. And so what we really want is soundness for mathematical certification for sure. So we want soundness, right? And we want scalability. So we want to be able to scale, to be able to run this verifier on uh, realistic networks, on um, large deep neural networks, right? Used in practice. And we want it to be precise. So we want it to be essentially informally as complete as possible, right? Uh, may, may not be 100% complete. There may still be cases where the property holds, but it cannot prove it, but we want it to be as complete as possible, right? So these are the three dimensions so you want the verifier obviously to be sound. If it is not 100% sound, at least you need to have some probabilistic guarantees, but we'll get to that later. So you want soundness. We want scalability, being able to handle large networks. 
and we want it to be precise. Okay, so these two, uh, these last two points, scalability and precision, they tend to conflict sometimes or often because there is a trade-off, right? The more scalable it is, typically you may have, you may need to lose some precision as well. Now, why did we go from sound incomplete to sound and incomplete, right? Well, there is this there is this fundamental problem here, right? It's known as the Rice theorem, okay, in verification, which basically says that it is not possible to construct an automated method that is both sound and complete. So generally, if you have arbitrary computation, like arbitrary programs with loops, recursion, it is not possible to build such an automated verifier. Okay, so you need to sacrifice something. If you're moving down to the theorem proving space, you may actually uh, keep sound and complete, but uh, you know, introduce uh, uh, sacrifice automation. But if you want to be automated, then you need to be, um, then uh, you cannot build for sure sound and complete verifier. Now, in the case of neural networks, actually, these are relatively restricted types of computations. Uh, they're loop free, right? There's no loops there. Um, so, um, and they are composed of specific activation functions, affine transforms, and so on. Um, it is possible to be both in the, in, for, most, for most neural networks, right? For, class, for a class of neural networks that are used in practice, you can build theoretically sound and complete uh, verifier. Right? So what's the problem? Well, the problem is what I mentioned already. The problem is that this verifier may actually not scale. It may not be able to process realistic networks. And so we have this tension here between scalability, right, and precision. So at the higher level, we are really trading off scalability for completeness, right? Um, so we, we, we lose precision. In other words, we may not be able to prove um, some property that actually holds, but that would hopefully is rare. And uh, we do scale to large networks, so like large uh, deep models. So this is the space of, uh, certification. And so, you know, the way that the field of certification of neural network has evolved is that um, there is some action here. There's several verifiers that are sound and complete, and we're going to look at them. They typically work for small to medium-sized networks. You know, let's not, let's not give like exact uh, numbers, but let's say 20,000 neurons or 10,000 neurons, 30,000 neurons, right? Certainly not hundreds of millions of neurons, right? Um, so that's nice for certain restriction, restricted uh, application domains. This actually is useful if you have sound and complete uh, verifier. Like for instance, um, there is a neural network called ACAS, ACAS, uh, ACAS uh, Air Collision Avoidance System, which is a relatively small network with specific pre and post conditions for which it is useful to have sound and complete verifier and where you're just trying to make it as fast as possible for, for uh, the verifier on this kind of network, small networks. Now for realistic networks, sound and complete, you know, completeness is actually hard. And so we really have to sacrifice a bit of completeness and um, how much um, you know, we'll study depending on the kind of relaxation that we're using. But, um, you know, uh, that's for handling realistic networks and being automated on top of that, we need to sacrifice a little bit of completeness, right? And so the action is really about what you want to do is you want to build, you want to speed up the sound and complete verifiers, right? You want to make them as fast as possible and scalable as possible while keeping sound and complete. While for the incomplete verifiers, um, which are sound, there what you want to do is to, to make them as, uh, as precise as possible, right? So this is the two ends of the spectrum in a sense, right? So we're going to be studying both of these branches of certification in the next uh, in the next lectures. Here we're going to start with incomplete verification, automated reasoning, and then um, in the next lecture we're going to start looking at complete methods. And actually, we will see how to combine them, how to use uh, sound and incomplete um, verifiers to uh, improve the scalability, the speed, if you want, of the sound and complete verifiers. All right, so let's uh, move on. Okay, I already mentioned this, um, right? So there is, uh, we're going to cover the, uh, you know, the two kinds of sound you know, certification, which is incomplete but scalable methods, um, typically based on some convex relaxation. Today we're going to look at 
one of the simplest convex relaxations, just to give you the idea and the concepts behind these convex relaxations and how they're used. Okay. And over here, I have outlined, I have listed some of these um, uh, convex relaxations. So this is a, you know, uh, the zonal top relaxation and the restricted polyhedral relaxation and then the box, which is like the simplest one. And then we're going to be looking at complete but scalable methods, typically based on this uh, mixed integer, integer linear solvers. Uh, linear solver, right? Mu. Uh, and we're going to look at the combination of both of these techniques. Okay, so this is a fairly rich space of uh, research, and many interesting um, mathematical approximation methods can be used to so to, to push the field forward along these two, um, you know, axes here, uh, and their combination potentially. Okay, so let's. Um, Take a look at uh, incomplete methods, right? Um, and so, what we're going to be do, what we're going to be doing, is we're going to start looking at a particular style of incomplete certification, which has proven most successful in practice, and it is perhaps the cleanest to explain, easiest to grasp, um, and that's based on this idea of bound propagation, so propagating a symbolic shape for the for the deep neural network, right? Um, so what you're going to do, we're going to start with our precondition phi that we've seen. And this is the thing that we refer to in the case of images, the symbolic image, because it captures lots of concrete images. You don't have to think of it this way, but it is just some symbolic shape phi. We're going to push this phi through the layers of the network, right? The ReU layer or the affine layer, sigmoid layer, whatever layers that it has. We're going to push it. I have to see what that means to be pushing it. And we're going to be computing an over approximation of the effect of each layer. We're going to be potentially including some activation values at that, at that layer that actually cannot happen um, for any point inside phi had we run it for the network. We'll, we'll see an example of that, so don't worry about this here. So let's let's see a little bit how you know we would instantiate this pipeline for uh, for our problem of. Uh, Proving robustness of characters, uh, of character recognition, right? So this setup we already seen. We have the. So let me just get the. Um, get the coloring. Uh, so we already seen the five before. We don't have to repeat this. So we have some region that is captured by this symbolic shape over here. The region five, and this lay this these arrows here are the layers. Maybe a fine layer, maybe sigmoid layer, maybe a, a review layer, some layer. Okay. And so. What we have here is that we're going to be taking the shape phi, you know, this region here, this picture, and we're going to push it for the first network, for the first layer of the network, whatever that layer is. And we'll see what pushing means. We're going to get some convex approximation. We're going to get some shape over here. And then we're going to push that one through over here for the second layer, and so on and so forth, right? We're going to be pushing that stuff uh, through, the, through the neural network, right? And ultimately, when we finish this pushing and we get to the last layer, let's say before the softmax layer, uh, we are going to end up with some shape over here. Okay, some shape, some convex shape. Um, and that convex shape, let's call it phi of n. Um, why did we pick n? Well, potentially because this was after the nth uh, layer. And so we have this phi of n. You know, this has still nothing to do with C, the property that we want to prove. We just get some shape. And again, don't worry about this, uh, this epsilons over here. This is just some symbolic, symbolic coefficient, symbolic um, values, if you like. We don't have to worry about them. Really, this is capturing the zonotop, which is a convex relaxation that we're going to be looking at later. But the important bit here is that this is a symbolic shape. This is a, a symbolic shape. OK. Now, what does over approximation mean more technically? Well, what over approximation means is that this phi of n here, the shape phi of n here, it can contain some points. It can, you know, this region over here, we are drawing some points. There may be some points here, some orange points, okay, some of these, which cannot be produced by any corresponding concrete point here on the left. So there is no concrete point here that you can find that satisfies this phi that you can run through the network for these layers and obtain a point over here. You know, for many of the points, hopefully, when you run them through the concrete points, you end up with some point, you know, in the in the brown region at the end. But there may be some points here 
uh, there may be some points here in the brown region for which there is no corresponding point here in the beginning that you can run so to obtain this particular orange orange point here so we this is called an over approximation and there may be just even an entire region which cannot happen uh, cannot occur um, so this over approximation essentially balancing out how much um, infeasible points you introduce in the brown shape uh, versus how fast you can actually perform this how fast and precise you can perform this uh, you can push the network for this for this for this um, arrows here is really what uh, the game is in uh, incomplete certification, right? So we're trying to produce as little as possible um, invisible points here at the end while speeding up the uh, propagation, okay? So I hope this gives you a little bit of an idea. So this would be step one. So we've pushed this thing through, okay? Uh, but now what? We still haven't done any verification. We just pushed it through, okay? And just before we go to verification, um, I remarked to you that here, this phi of n, uh, you may actually not even do verification in certain cases if you're looking at certified defenses, something that we'll be looking at in the follow-up lectures. You can actually use this region phi of n in some way to, uh, to perform your training. Uh, that's just a side comment, uh, prefetching a little bit the uh, certified defenses that we'll look at later. But now we're interested in certification, so we take this region phi of n. And what we want to do is to take it um, and to check that every point inside this region phi of n satisfies our property. So our property is uh, psi, as we already seen, right over here. So let's uh, second this is psi, and we want to che check that every point inside the brown region satisfies this property. In, in other words, every point in the brown region classifies to the label t. That's what we want to do, even potentially the infeasible points that could happen here. The fact that they're infeasible may actually not be a problem because for our property that we care to prove, right? Um, so there's several points here. So first of all, um, right, because the phi of n is an over approximation, right, it captures, it has, it may contain some infeasible points. If we fail to prove the property, like if this doesn't hold, somehow, well, it could be that the property is really violated. Really, there is a point here, which if you run through, there is a, you end up with a point in the brown region which violates the property, or, you know, really had an invisible point and the property actually holds, but you cannot prove it because of this over approximation business, right? And so this is, a, this is, a, this is one of the points that um, you know, over approximation um, can, um, can induce this, um, incompleteness, uh, but you need to have it in some sense if you want to be, uh, to be, um, to be able to handle realistic networks, right? Um, so now, of course, it could be that, again, you have invisible points over here in the brown region, but they actually, the property still holds them. So you're still able to verify it. So one obvious point here is that this, uh, this property C, the weaker the property is, right, the, you know, the, 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 the simplest in the sense that property is, the more over approximation it can tolerate, right? So it's a very simple property, then it may be able to tolerate more over approximation than if it is a very complicated property. And so in some sense, this calls for, um, you know, just think of it, think we're thinking now in a sense, right? Um, that depending on this property, See, we can actually, uh, you know, most methods don't do that, but you could, and some, some, some do. Uh, you could actually pick the kind of, you know, you can, you can, you can, uh, depending on if it's a very weak property, you may be able to actually be faster here at the preprocessing and end up uh, potentially, you know, more coarse grain layers here, more co coarse grain shape. Sorry, right? You may be more coarse grain, maybe introducing more garbage, more infeasible points, but you can, you can process it really quickly here. Boom, processing. Um, because it may not matter for your property that you that you care about. Um, this is not so easy to do, but it's just a point to keep in mind. Okay. In practice, uh, for most verifiers, they they may ignore the property and they just push the thing through, and then they just get the brown shape, and then they they, they just check it. Okay. 
So this is this is the some points on uh, complete uh, incomplete certification, sound and sound certification, um, and then uh, this uh, instantiating these problems to uh, to uh, to robustness. Um, Oopsie. Okay, so now the fundamental problem is what uh, in this uh, automated certification business. Um, so the fundamental problem is that you have to somehow produce these convex shapes. You have to produce these shapes here, these over approximate shapes that capture the over approximations. And you know you need two parts in order to um, you need to define two parts in order to be able to build such a verifier. So the first one that you need to, to define is um, what is the shape of this convex approximation here, right? What is the shape of this? Is it a box? Is it a polyhedra? Is it something very loose like a box or it's something very, very precise, you know, like convex polyhedra or maybe it's, a, maybe it's you know, it's even a, a quadratic equation or maybe it's some other restricted uh, polyhedra like zonotope and so on and so forth. And so that's the fundamental question one. What is that convex approximation? And a lot is answered from this convex approximation because some are very expensive to produce, some are much cheaper to produce, like box is much cheaper to build, to construct, than it is to construct polyhedra shapes, which are more precise, but more expensive to compute. Um, and then the second question is, how are these convex approximations right, produced? So what is the effect of these arrows here, right? These layers are now operating on symbolic values rather than concrete values, right? And this effect here, uh, that's an important term that is used in, in analysis, in uh, program analysis, static analysis, abstract interpretation. Okay, this thing over here, you know, um, when it works on symbolic shape, like, like here, this, this transformer, uh, this one here, this, 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 this arrow works on the symbolic shape to produce this shape, right? And so in that case, this layer, we have an abstract version, symbolic version of the con of, of the layer, and this is referred to as a uh, abstract transformer, right? So this is called an abstract transformer, which is uh, in uh, contrast to a concrete transformer, which would be just the um, just pushing a point through the through the layer, right? So often people talk about abstract layers, meaning the effect of the layer of the real or a fine layer on a on an abstract shape on a symbolic shape. Okay, and as I mentioned, this important trade-off, uh, we have this uh, you know, trade-off between approximation and scalability, between approximation and speed. Um, you know, transformer for intervals and box, they're very fast, but they introduce quite a bit over approximation, or polyhedra could be you know, uh, much more expensive, exponential really in the number of dimensions that you have, um, but actually could be much more precise, so it would introduce much fewer infeasible points. So what we're going to do now, we're going to look at box because box is very important in various settings, including certified training. Um, it is uh, pre-processing for MUP solvers, combinations with other uh, common relaxations and so on. And um, we can illustrate the, you know, the key ideas there uh, before we get to the more complicated common relaxations. All right. So, um, so let's look at this incomplete method one box. Um, later, we'll, we'll look at a couple more methods like uh, zonotops and restricted polyhedra, but let's focus on box now. Um, as I mentioned here, it's going to be used both for certification. Actually, next lecture, we'll see how to use box for you know, speeding up MUP solvers, complete verification, but also used in um, certified defenses in probable training. So that's, that's, a, that's an important thing to know. So now, Let's introduce the abstract transformers for the box relaxation, okay, which uh, we need for handling uh, neural networks. So we're going to show it here for um, a fine layer and for the um, for the ReU uh, activation layer. Okay, so we're going to show the abstract transformers. Okay, so what we have here, uh, let me just find it. So if we have an addition, so here A and B are m-dimensional vectors, right? Where we have that, uh, you know, every element here in one is less than the other, just to simplify the uh, notation. And uh, ReU is, is, as, is, as, uh, is, as, is as you expect, um, definition of ReU, the max of zero and x. And the symbol here denotes the 
you know, this uh, symbol here denotes the sharp symbol here, denotes the abstract effect of the operation. So when you have plus, it is just the normal concrete operation, right? And then um, maybe of two vectors or of two scalars, but if you have the sharp here, it means the abstract version of the plus. Okay, that's commonly one way to denote it. So if we have the plus abstract transformer for boxes or intervals, intervals or boxes, like just the same synonym for the same thing, right? we keep a range uh, for every value and now. And so for now, you can even imagine that this has scalars just to like, uh, you know, just simplify the discussion. So I have two scalars A and B, and I'm adding, you know, some interval here AB where A is less than B, and you have another, um, another. Um, interval here, uh, C and D, right? So the left-hand side of the interval is always less than or equal to the right-hand side of the interval, as we already shown here. This is without loss of generality. And then what you do to define the plus transformer is you add up the, uh, add up the left-hand left, uh, side of both intervals and end up with the new left-hand side for the new interval, and you add up the right-hand side of the both intervals. And similarly, you can define not just the addition abstract transformer, but also the negation of an interval and the review transformer as well over here, um, right? As well as multiplication by a constant, right? Over here, it's a multiplication by a constant over here. All right, so with this multiplication by a constant addition and subtraction, we can handle, so with this one, this one, the first, second, and, and, and fourth rows, we can handle affine transforms. That's all we need to handle affine transform, addition, subtraction, multiplication by constant. Okay. And then with the third row, we can handle the ReU uh, layers. So with these four transformers, we can handle um, deep neural networks, which consist of affine and um, ReU layers, which is pretty much many of. Uh, um, you know, these this are staple layers for pretty much any uh, modern neural network, right? Um, in the exercises, you'll be deriving transformers for some other uh, uh, for some other layers, but here, um, here is the transformers for ReU and Affine, which are fundamental. Okay, so you can uh, prove uh, in an exercise that these transformers are actually sound, right? They are sound meaning that um, you know, if, a, if you process the network with a, a, a neural network that consists of affine and ReU layers, right? And if the property is violated there, then this uh, verifier with box is going to detect that they are, um, that, the, that uh, you know, it's gonna report the violation there, okay? So this is our four abstract, first abstract transformers that we've seen very simple abstract transformers, but you can play with it a bit and we'll see some example now, uh, just to get an idea here what is going on. Okay, so one point before we continue is separating these notions of optimality and exactness. Okay, when we're talking about this, you know, uh, abstract transformers. So what we have here is that the optimal box transformer, okay, is not exact actually. Right, so this is to be expected. You know, box is not the same as uh, using polyhedra. So the best you can do using boxes, even if it's the best you can do using boxes, may just not be the best that you can do overall. And then you can illustrate this uh, issue and this. Uh, um, you can illustrate the incompleteness, if you want, uh, the lack of precision uh, here on this example. So here we have, uh, we're gonna use this diagram in the later slides. So what we have here <clears throat> is we have this, uh, uh, these neurons, which uh, have certain values, okay. So you have X1 and X2. Well, these are, these are I guess, is some uh, pixels and these are, the, these are the first neurons, X3, X4. So we have some inputs here, uh, two pixels, uh, X1, X2. Um, and the ranges, uh, each value ranges between 0 and 0 0.3 and 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. And maybe you obtain this um, from the, um, using some form of L infinity or some other, um, some other precondition that you define. So this 0 point, these guys here form, form the phi, the precondition of the, of, the, of the network. So let's say, let's suppose that we have a layer here, um, 
an affine layer. So here we have an affine layer where, you know, given this input, you're producing the output. Okay, so here for X3, we're going to have the, the value for X3 will be computed by X1, you know, um, plus uh, X2, right? So this is the weight on the edges. It is on purpose put as one, just to simplify the, uh, the example and to show you this key point, okay? For in a simple toy, toy example. Okay, the bias here is zero above the, above the, on this neuron. And um, so it's, it's, it's not going to affect the computation. So for X3, we're going to end up with, you know, the value for X3 is X1 plus X2, and the value for X4 is X1 minus X2. So this is the affine layer over here. You know, these arrows here capture the affine layer. Okay, so really what we have, if you look at the, if you want to reason very exactly, you would end up with something like, you know, X3 is X1 plus X2, we just can call the affine layer, and we know that X1 and X2 are in this range, 0 to 0 0.3 and 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. This would be exactly, you know, the values for X3 and X4 that you can obtain, and these constraints capture the possible values that are valid for X3 and X4. Now, if you use the optimal box transformers, the best that you can do with box that is with intervals, right, what you're going to end up with, and you can check this yourself by using the transformers on the previous slide, you end up with something like X3 is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.7, which is over here. And X4, uh, neuron X4, you know, has the values uh, minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.2. So this is the range of values that this X3 and X4 can have. According to the uh, box transformer, box abstract transformer, um, which is optimal for the box, um, right? Now, the problem is that what you see, so we get these intervals here, here, and here, X3 and X4, but we actually, according to these intervals, have a valid point inside the intervals, right? We have the point X3 could be 0 0.7. This could be the case because it says it can be 0 0.7. Uh, and X4 could be minus 0 0.4, and this is minus 0 0.4, okay? And now what you see is that, um, all right, what you see is that um, these values that we get here, right, are actually, um, they're actually infeasible values, right? So uh, these values actually cannot happen if you uh, plug them in here. They are actually invalid, invalid values and you can, uh, you can uh, plug it in here and to see why this is not possible. And so, these points are allowed by the box, but they are actually infeasible. They cannot uh, occur if you would have calculated the exact bounds here. All right, and so you can play with this a little bit and uh, you know, you'd end up here with 0 0.7 equal to X1 plus X2 and minus 0 0.4 equal to X1 minus X2. Then you see that this is actually not, not feasible. So in a sense, you can already see that there is, you know, these boxes give a good intuition, but actually it's not the most best thing you can do. It scales fairly. It scales fairly well. Um, you know, you can already see another point. This X3 and X4. You have kind of a relationship, relational information here between X3 and X4 that is captured for X1 and X2. Okay, that's something that we're going to see later with the more complex convex relaxations. But okay, so optimal box, box transformer. So the fact that you have optimality for the particular convex relaxation that you pick, right? Whatever convex relaxation it is. I mean, you'd have a similar problem, in fact, exactly the same problem if you're working with other restrictions, um, if, which are even more precise than box. It just the, just the constraints and the example would look different, but keep this point in mind. The best thing that you can do in your particular relaxation may not be actually the same result as the absolute exact thing that you can do, okay? All right, uh, so let's move on here. So we made this point. Um, uh, well, I already mentioned this, right? I even wrote it so that it is, uh, so that we don't mix these notions of optimality of the transformers for the particular convex relaxation that we're using with um, completeness and exactness, right? Um, now, of course, as we mentioned already, the fact that you are not exact, the fact that you lose some completeness, the fact that you are imprecise, 
when it comes to comparing with the exact reasoning, um, does not mean that your success in the certification will be affected. It may be affected, it may not be. Okay, so it may be fine to actually use box for certain cases, right? Um, you may end up actually with very good results. Um, so you should always try the simple method first. So let's see. Um, and so this is a slightly deeper neural network, still a toy one, okay? So what we have here is with this neural network, oops, let's see, is uh, we have the affine layer. This is the affine layer here, the first one. Then we have a ReLU layer. And then we have, we have an affine layer again. So affine, ReLU affine. And the inputs, the precondition phi, okay, is just like as before. X, uh, you know, uh, the input ranges between uh, uh, 0 and 0 0.3, these pixel values, and between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. So this is the values, if you want, of these input neurons here. Um, okay, and so um, what happens is that we are again going to take the 0 0.03 you know, and this, 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 this range is here, and this range over here, right? And we're going to push it through the network. We're using the abstract transformers that we saw before. Okay, we actually just saw the first part in the previous slide, up to x3, x4. We are pushing it through, we are pushing it through the max, right? You can see, for instance, if it's between 0 0.4, minus 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it gets truncated, so you end up with uh, 0 to 0 0.2, right? Um, okay? And this nothing needs to be truncated because the lower value here is above uh, 0. And so if you push it through like that, we are going to end up with some... Uh, uh, values and here I have put some bias of 0 0.5 and another bias of minus 0 0.5 for this for these output neurons. Um, but you end up with some intervals here for for, uh, for each of these for each of these uh, taking into account the bias right doing the affine transform. Um, so this one O1 here would be something like O1 would be x5 times one um, plus minus one times x6. Uh, pl uh, plus uh, minus 0 0.5. So just the affine transform over here, right? Then you can check that. If you do the affine transform, you're going to get the following ranges here uh, using the affine, the abstract transform we showed before. But the key point here is, that's a good exercise to do, but the key point, key point we want to show here is that we use box, we use this very simple convex relaxation, and we actually can prove here, so look at the range, we have 0 0.6 to 1.4, and we have minus 0 0.6 to 0 0.2. So the maximum value that 0 0.1 can take is 0 0.2, and the minimum value that O0 can take is 0 0.6. And so, um, you know, uh, we are guaranteed that the value of O0 is for sure higher than the value of O1. So we have proved that for sure, um, given this input here, x1, x2, this, this simple image, you know, two pixels, um, any region, you know, we put regions around these pixels, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, some region. Um, so this symbolic input that we're pushing through, right, to this, this simple image, um, every point inside that symbolic uh, region is going to get classified to zero, right, to this, to what whatever this, uh, label zero here indicates, okay? So it's going to get classified here as zero. That's because 0 0.6 to 1.4 is certainly uh, mathematically so greater than uh, the region minus 0 0.6 to 0 0.2, okay? So we have proven that no matter which points we pick in these input ranges, 0 0.3, 0 to 0 0.3, 0 0.1 to 0 0.4, we're guaranteed that each of them will get classified as zero without having to enumerate all the combinations here uh, in the range uh, 0 0.003 and 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. Okay, so even though we have incompleteness, even though we have lost precision for sure in these intermediate intervals, and even here at the end, we're still able to prove the property that we care about, okay, for this particular network that we are processing. Now let's look at the opposite case to where we we'll fail to do that, and it's what you expect. Um, so again, we push the stuff through the network, but we just increase the ranges here a little bit. So it was not like 0 to 0 0.3 and 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. Now we've increased the ranges, you know, we made the bigger. Um, and so 
what happens here is, and you can actually check that that's interesting, is that if you push it through like before, you're gonna end up with 0 0.6 to 2.3 and minus 0 0.9 to 0 0.8. And here the intervals overlap, right? Um, in the range 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. The upper bound of the 0 0.1 uh, neuron is uh, higher than the lower bound of the uh, O0 neuron, the first, the zero uh, of, of this O0 neuron, which is 0 0.6. So the overlap in that range. So now you will not be able to prove anymore that all of the input points in the range, you know, X1 in the range 0 0.06 and X2 in the range 0 0.1, 0 0.7, for sure, 100% mathematically so, are guaranteed to classify to label uh, zero because there is an overlap here between, this, between these two intervals over here. Right? You can see that they intersect and the intersection is uh, non-empty, okay? And so what has happened is we have failed to prove the property that we care with this simple convex relaxation, even though you can actually check using what we use later, like mixed integer linear programming solvers that the property actually holds. Okay, so we fail to prove it because the intervals intersect and we cannot prove that one is strictly greater than the other. And so now we've illustrated that um, over approximation, uh, even with a simple relaxation, may be enough to prove the property, okay? Um, but you can also fail to prove the property if you over, if, 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 if you know, perhaps the input is too big or the over approximation is too simple, okay? Uh, now, in this case, the property actually holds and we fail to prove it. So we want, may want to start looking into more precise relaxations, something we'll look at later. It could also be the case that the property actually doesn't hold. And because our box transformers are sound, it's going to say that it doesn't hold. So we are good there. So our main problem is when the property actually does hold, which is the case here, that we are not able to prove it and that motivates the need for, um, you know, for um, uh, uh, complete methods and more precise relaxations. Okay. Now, of course, you can start thinking about things like, you know, that are relatively simple, but have limited success in practice, maybe a little bit. You can start splitting these intervals and generating lots of box verification problems. So that split this interval, let's say 0, 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, so a bunch of splits and the same way split this here and take the cross product of these guys, you know, end up with uh, many instances that you can run through it. And this way you increase the uh, precision of the relaxation in a sense by considering simpler, uh, considering tighter ranges on the input. Yeah. So some splitting may, uh, refinement may also help even with a simple convex relaxation like box. So keep that in mind. But there are smarter ways to go about it, and we'll look at we'll look at um, we'll look at those next in the next lectures. Okay, so um, so what we've seen in this lecture is we started looking at the problem of mathematical certification of neural networks, right? So we stated the problem. You need to define this precondition, right? The input region in the case of robustness, uh, and the post condition, which is direct because we're talking about robustness. So everything in the input region has to classify to the same point. But there could be different pairs of pre and post conditions that depending on the application domain, like this air collision uh, avoidance system neural network that I mentioned, which have quite different pre post conditions that have nothing to do really with the L infinity norms and whatnot. But the methods of certification that we're looking at still applies everything. It's a very general theory that we are looking at. And so once we stated the problem, uh, we started uh, having a little bit of a taxonomy, you know, defining sound and unsound verifiers as well as complete and incomplete verifiers, right? And we said that ideally we want to have, you know, sound and complete certification. But the problem is that, you know, due to the completeness, this uh, typically doesn't scale to very large networks. And it's, uh, you know, a very active research area trying to scale to make uh, sound and complete verifiers to scale to bigger, uh, bigger models, right? And this motivated us to start looking at uh, sound and incomplete methods where we are trading off precision, we are trading off some completeness, uh, introducing some over approximation in the process 
in order to scale to larger networks. And um, in the process, we started with the simplest um, convex relaxation, which is the intervals, the box uh, convex relaxation. And what we saw there is that, um, you know, this introduces, certainly introduces noise and then introduces points that are invisible when we are processing the input region. Uh, in some cases, when the, you may be able to actually prove the property even with this relaxation, so that's always good to try because it's a very fast relaxation to analyze with. But if you fail to prove the property, then you may start thinking about more elaborate convex relaxations. Right? So we formally defined the abstract transformers of box, and um, you know we 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 uh, saw how to apply apply these transformers for a very simple toy neural network. And in the exercise, you have plenty of um, plenty of uh, exercises to deal with this uh, to explore this relaxation. An important point here, right, that the fact that you're optimal for the particular convex relaxation in this case box, right does not mean that you are producing the same results as exact uh, certification because the exact result may not be representable in your uh, using the limited constraints that you're allowed to use in this case, uh, concrete intervals with the box uh, convex relaxations. Okay, so I hope that uh, this lecture was useful to you to introduce some of the basics of mathematical certification of neural networks. And uh, in the next lecture, what we're going to be doing, we are now that we know how the box uh, convex relaxation works, we're going to be looking at it uh, and uh, using it to uh, speed up uh, complete certification methods like uh, mixed integer uh, linear programming. So we'll look at mixed integer linear programming, how to encode the neural network in MIOP solvers, and how to speed up the, uh, the sound and complete verifier. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Thank you for listening, and um, I hope you enjoy the lectures. And uh, see you, uh, see you next time.